Welcome to the Von Karman Lectureship in Astronautics. Uh, I'm Dave Throckmorton. I'm General Chair for SciTech 2014. And more importantly tonight, I'm a member of the Honors and Awards Committee of the AAA. And it's truly my privilege tonight to, be have, to have the opportunity to introduce the recipient of the 2014 Von Karman Lectureship in Astronautics. This lectureship is one of the Institute's uh, highest honors its most prestigious awards. It's of course named in honor of Theodore von Karman, a uh, world-renowned authority in the aerospace sciences, and it showcases as an individual in our industry who has distinguished him or herself technically in the field of astronautics. The 2014 recipient of the von Karman Lectureship in Astronautics is Dr. Antonio Elias. Early in his career, Dr. Elias worked on the design of the Space Shuttle Orbiter's avionics system at the Draper Laboratory, where he originated the shuttle's terminal area energy management guidance concept. Subsequent to his time at Draper, he spent some years at uh, the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautic Engineering at MIT in various teaching and research positions. And in 1986, he joined the staff of the Orbital Sciences Corporation. At Orbital, Dr. Elias led the technical team that designed and built the Pegasus Air Launched Booster. And in, in the course of that program, he flew on the B-52 carrier aircraft as the launch vehicle operator on the very first flight of the Pegasus rocket. He also led the teams at Orbital that uh, designed their Apex and Sea Star satellites uh, and the X-34 hypersonic research vehicle. In 1989, Dr. Elias was named Orbital's first Vice President of Engineering. And in his ensuing years at Orbital, he served in a, a number of different positions to include Corporate Senior Vice President, Chief Technical Officer, and General Manager of Orbital's Advanced Programs Group. Currently, Dr. Elias is Orbital's Executive Vice President and Chief Technical Officer. Uh, you should probably note that one week ago tomorrow, Orbital Sciences Antares rocket successfully lifted off from Wallops Flight Facility, not far from here. And on Sunday of this week, uh, successfully berthed with the International Space Station on Orbital Sciences' first commercial cargo delivery mission to the ISS. So the subject of Dr. Elias' uh, conversation with us tonight is very timely. The title of this lecture is Space Transportation, Past, Present, and question mark. So if you will, please uh, welcome to the podium Dr. Antonio Elias. Okay. Go get him. Good, um, good afternoon. When I uh, accepted to um, give this little speech um, a few months ago and we chose this uh, topic of space transportation. I didn't think really very well about it. <clears throat> so I decided to go to the Merriam-Webster dictionary and find out what the definition of the transitive word transport, verb transportation was. And I found not one but three definitions. And the first one is the obvious one, to carry something or somebody from one place to another. But I found the other two exceptions being equally applicable to our topic today. The second one is to cause somebody to imagine that he or she is in a different place or time. And the third one is to cause somebody to feel very happy, interested, or excited. Now, the event that David mentioned earlier, the launch of the Antares rocket uh, on Thursday, and the birthing of the Cygnus spacecraft, and your little Freudian slip actually helps the case that I'm going to try and do today. Um, for me, that was not only an example of transportation. Definitely, you can say that carrying cargo from Earth to the space station is to carry something from one place to another. But at least for me, it caused me to imagine that I was at least in a different place. I wish I were there. There are people in this audience that have been there, like Frank Culberson, and it certainly caused me to feel very happy, interested, and excited. 
However, if you look back at 2013, only 11 of the 82 space launches that were attempted in 2013 had at its destination the space station. So does, does that mean the other 85% are not transportation? Um, well, certainly in terms of public interest, I was very disappointed that at our mission control room on Sunday, there was one journalist, one NASA dignitary, Bill Rabel, and us chickens. Whereas at the launch at Wallops on Thursday, it was crowded. I mean, I, I had to change hotels because I could not get an entire reservation. People flocked. There were people at the hotel breakfast um, nook that said, oh, we've driven from Pennsylvania to watch this launch. There is something about space launch that excites people and transports them to a different place in time a lot more than satellites and trivial things like that. Now, so what I'm going to talk about really is space launch. And before going to the past, present, and whatever else comes after present, there's a point I want to make that we sometimes tend to forget. And it's something that we have to remind not just ourselves, but everybody else that we interact with, which is the incredible amount of energy density, the power, that is involved in space launch. Some pond said that second only to nuclear warfare, space launch is the fastest way to destroy the most amount of value that mankind has ever devised. Let me give you some examples. Um, if you look at the average US citizen, the per capita consumption of energy in the United States is about 10 kilowatts or let me put it in megawatts, and it's 0 0.01 megawatts. When you drive your nice 28 miles per gallon car at uh, 65 miles per hour in the highway, you are using about 85 kilowatts thermal. I'm going to measure these energies in terms of thermal. Of course, the internal combustion engine is a little bit inefficient, so you're actually using about 30, 40 horsepower, but you are consuming 85 kilowatts thermal, 0.085. What's called an ultra-large crude carrier, ULCC, these are these incredible 650,000 pound dis uh, tons displacement, displacement super carriers, so big they can't even navigate the, Eng the English Channel. Those consume about the same amount of fuel per hour as a Boeing 747. So curiously, those two modes of transportation um, consume about 170 thermal megawatts in its normal use. Now, the ultra-large cargo carrier goes very slow, 15, 16 knots. You go to a faster, larger ship like a nuclear aircraft carrier, and even though it has about 1,100 um, megawatts of thermal install, when it goes full blast, it consumes about 700 megawatts. Um, about 45 miles as the crow flies from here, is the um, Calvert Cliffs, Maryland, nuclear power plant. It has two nuclear reactors, and combined, they produce 5,400 megawatts, or 5.4 gigawatts, thermal. Our little Antares rocket at liftoff produces three times as much power, albeit for only about four minutes, as the nuclear power plant. And if we go back to the Saturn V, that itself produced more than 10 times the amount of instantaneous power as Little and Terry's. And that is something to bear in mind, that we are dealing with amounts of power that are second only to nuclear explosions. And that's what makes space launch hard, nothing else. So one and Terry's equals three nuclear power plants, fine. But I think it's even more telling to remember everybody that one and Terry's equals 98 Boeing 747s. And this begins my plea to try and avoid turning astronautics into aeronautics. The temptation to compare spacecraft and rockets to airplanes, a temptation that has been made easier by um, George Lucas and Star Wars, 
where you see this nice little uh, single person spacecraft that looked just like airplanes. That has been used in the past as a way to sell political progr po programs politically to the country. We are doing ourselves a disservice. This is a lot different. As a matter of fact, in spite of the attraction that Space Launch has, if you think about it, it's a means to an end. What brings in the money is a spacecraft that the launch vehicle accelerates. Launch vehicles are only nuisances. They cost money, and sometimes they blow up. I tell you, if Ben Franklin had been writing a letter uh, to his good friend Jean-Baptiste Leroy today, he would have written, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death, taxes, and space launch. Um, so, to quote uh, another Spaniard turned American, George Santayana, who is quoted as saying that um, those that cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, um, I'd like to take a look at the wide history of space launch and then focus in a little bit both on the United States and on the near term. And I'd like to focus first on the issue of reliability and then on the issue of cost. Uh, this is my plot of the annual launch attempt rate since October 4th, 1957 to December 31st of last year. And superimposed on those blue bars is a black line that represents a smoothed version of the failure rate corresponding to each of those years. And I had to smooth it, and I will smooth it in another plot, because it's actually a very noisy figure. We're dealing here with, fortunately, rare events, and unfortunately, rare numbers of trials and experiments. So statistics don't work too well under those circumstances. If we look at the whole history of space launch, it is tempting to divide it into four periods, at least from a, um, a worldwide viewpoint. Things will look a little bit different when we look at the United States. I'd like to propose that there was an initial period which I would call the rise. Um, it included a very rapid increase in the number of launch attempts, an abysmal initial failure rate. So high, it's even off this, the chart, and the right-hand side axis goes up to 15% failure rate. But at the same time, this was a period in which we had the Apollo moon flights, the highest worldwide rate, if you look at that um, um, the bar, the same year as the Apollo 1 fire, we had almost three launches a week. And in fact, there was actually a dramatic decrease, a factor of three decrease in failure rate in the 10 years um, between the beginning of that black line in the plot and the end of that uh, rise. But also equally important, if you look at the Cold War period as proxied by the history of the Berlin Wall, this fast rise coincides with the beginning of the Cold War, and you can see obviously the, 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 the attachment that is the uh, launch vehicles were associated with ICBMs on the Russian side and with reconnaissance spacecraft on the US side, and I belong to that generation that honestly believes that space had a big part in avoiding World War III. But it's also important to note, if you look at the bar labeled space shuttle, that the initial planning and thinking for the space shuttle happened during that time period. The second time period, which I label the golden years, or at least from the world um, perspective standpoint, shows a rather stable demand or stable launch rate of about 120 um, uh, launches per year, or one launch every three days. Um, a stable failure rate below 5%, well, it is noisy, as you can see, but that's because of the statistical properties of a small number of experiments. But if you, if you in your mind, flatten that curve, you see it's below 5%. It has the development and early flights of the space shuttle, but it also has the Challenger accident. And last but not least, if you look at the top of the chart, you see a bar called GPS development. And GPS is by far the most success successful and important constellation of spacecraft 
that mankind has produced, and it took many launches and many years to deploy. The third period we could call the crisis, roughly from 94 to 2005, and it's no coincidence that it happens after the fall of the Berlin Wall. That's when the number of launches decreased dramatically, but very telling. Look at the failure rate. It essentially doubles. Uh, however, even this black time had a couple of bright spots. It was the end of the GPS development. It was the beginning of the development of Ariane 5 and the two EELVs. And the brief but spectacular iridium flare, I know stargazers have another use for a term iridium flare, but by that I mean the amazing deployment of 72 satellites in just 12 days more than one year, with 15 launches by three different launch vehicles and 100% success rate. Now, it would be tempting to call the fourth period the recovery um, because and it's starting around 2004, 2004, 2005, saw the lowest worldwide launch rate, 55 launches a year, since 1961. However, you can see that the worldwide failure rate has stubbornly stayed above 5%. Now, if we zoom in from a world view to a US view, things change significantly. To begin with, the rice period is much shorter. Um, in 1966, the United States accounted for 82 out of 139 launch attempts, but only had four out of 14 failures. But since that peak, things really started going down, probably to the black year of the history of launch, space launch in the United States, 1986. In 1986, we not only saw the Challenger disaster, but we only attempted nine launches, compared to that with 139 in 66. And out of those nine launches, three fail. So a realized launch failure of 33%. On the other hand, one can claim that after this dark year, there was a relatively fast recovery, and other than a little plateau around the time of the iridium flare, if you straighten up that line, you can see that we've had a relatively constant launch rate for the past maybe 20 years or so, and that the U.S. failure rate, with its ups and its downs, has been slightly lower than 5%. What we're missing here is that the rest of the world is picking up. The United States is not. I attribute that to two phenomena. Number one, the increase in space activity in China. Number two, the decrease in the competitiveness of United States launch vehicles for commercial applications, which means business is flowing out of the United States. Now, th these are relatively uh, recent charts that I prepared for this lecture, so they, they end up at December 31st. I didn't have the time to update this also very telling history chart. This only goes to 2011, but the trend continues to 2013. You see here, for each year, the count of launch attempts divided into four size categories, small, Pegasus, Minotaurs, uh, Falcon 1s, uh, Nippers, uh, stuff like that. Medium, the obvious Delta 2s, the early Atlases, uh, Antares is a medium, and so on. Large, uh, EELV, um, Ariane, uh, Falcon 9, and heavy, Titan uh, 4, uh, Delta 4, Triple Core, and so on and so forth. Um, and as a clue, the, you focus on the yellowish, creamish, yellowish middle part. As you can see, this was the majority. Why? The very first launch in October 4th of 1957 was a medium class. As a matter of fact, that's the most durable and ubiquitous launch vehicle in the world. The all R7, turn uh, Vostok, turn Voskhod, turn Molnaya, turn Soyuz. But you can see that the medium class, the small class is kind of uh, also going down. But you can see starting in the um, um, late 70s, early 80s, 
the large class starts to creep up. And then starting in 2000 or so, uh, they really take off at the expense of the medium launch vehicle. And that is one of the causes for concern that I want to point out. So having looked at the past, let's come a little bit closer to the present. And I mentioned the two issues that I want to address was reliability and cost. Let's talk about reliability first. Uh, it's actually a tougher concept to pin down than one would think. There are three difficulties in evaluating the reliability of a launch vehicle or launch service to the point that it will affect somebody's decision to acquire this launch service or this launch vehicle or this other one. The most incredible one is that definition of success and failure is in the eye of the beholder. There are honest differences in when a launch constitutes a success or not. And it's no surprise that in general, the provider of the launch service tends to be very optimistic and the competitors of that rocket or that provider tend to be very pessimistic. The second and associated problem is to a certain degree reliability depends on doing things the way you did it before. So continuity of the design, continuity of the launch vehicle is important. Yet vehicles change and evolve. So do you look at specific individual models when you look at the historic reliability? Do you look at entire families? And again, just like in the definition of launch, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, give you an example of um, uh, different opinions in success. Orbital claims that three out of 42 Pegasus flights were failure. Others, mostly our competitors, claim there are four failures, not three. In terms of launch vehicles, um, SpaceX has recently transitioned their Falcon 9 from an initial version with a certain capability. This plot shows for the um, 30 years between 1984 and, 1913, and 2013, the US failure rate versus the number of launches for that particular calendar year. Now, um, it, it turns out that um, in, that, in those 30 years, there were 10 years with no failures, 13 years with only one failure, four years with two failures, um, one year, sorry, uh, two years with four failures, there was no year with exactly three failures. By the way, I'm one of those that counts the second shuttle accident as a launch failure. Even though the accident itself happened during re-entry, it was caused by something that happened during launch. Also, for the shuttle, the distinction between launch and launch success and return being an, a reusable launch vehicle is in, intrinsic. So I called both of the shuttle accidents launch accidents. And that is why you see essentially three groupings of points. Um, there's obviously those years where there were no failures. Then the vast majority of the years are one failure, and obviously what you see there is simply the division of one by the number of launches that year. Then you see four points there with the two failures, and 95, 99, uh, and 86, which again, because there were only nine launches that year, the, launch, the failure rate is 33%, so it's off scale. And that straight line there is the trend line of all of those. And <clears throat> notice how curiously close the trend line is to the one failure per year points. Almost as if, and you know, I'm not superstitious, I don't believe in Ouija boards, but it almost seems as if long-term statistically, we will see one launch failure per year, no matter how many launches we have. So what is the obvious consequence? The more launches we have, since we're only going to average once a year, the better our failure rate is going to be. 
Now, this is not just superstition. If you think about it, there is something on the launch rate. As you launch more vehicles, you are more proficient, your production rate is higher, your industrial base. So there may be some fundamental mechanism at work here that supports that theory. Now, I said there were three difficulties in determining failure rate. One being what constitutes failure of success. Two, what constitutes an entire family of vehicles. The third one is, should we use simply the division of number of failures by total number of attempts as the measure of reliability? Well, if we did that, including last Thursday launch, and Terry's has a perfect reliability record. Three launches, three successes. Does that mean Antares has a 100% probability of success for the next launch? No. As a matter of fact, the much maligned shuttle that had two failures in 135 flights, I definitely would consider it more reliable than our Antares because of the number of tries. So what some people try and do is use the so-called Bayesian approach in which the nth plus one flight and its outcome constitutes one element of a series of events, success, success, failure, success, 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 failure, success, success, success next launch, and the ensemble of probabilities of those events is analyzed statistically in, you know, using Bayes' theorem to come up at what is the best estimate of the probability that the nth plus one launch is going to be successful? Aerospace Corporation uses this. Ed Kyle, one of the gurus of the internet in terms of uh, space statistics, uses it. And when we do that, it turns out that our three successes in three attempts on Terry's has a probability of fourth flight success of only 25%. The first probability of failure of 25%, not of 0%. So let's take a look at the Bayesian um, probability of failure, and I like to look at failure rather than success because it's a more sensitive number, of a number of US launch vehicle, again, families, for the 10 years between 2004 and 2013. Now, don't pay too much attention to the numbers associated with individual launch vehicles because the fact that I've used the past 10 years penalizes some vehicle statistics and helps some vehicle statistics. An example of a vehicle that is being helped is Ariane 5. That's artificially good because starting at 2004, we chop off the early 99, 2000 early flight failures of Ariane 5. A vehicle that's hindered or penalized by chopping off at 2005 and 4 is a space shuttle. Shows that 8% a Bayesian probability of the 136 flight being successful because we don't count all the flights before 2004 or the failure before 2004. But the important thing is the shape of the line. I took a crack at fitting a uh, power curve, and the power curve seems to be the best fit to that set of data. And you can see the short number of flight vehicles there, Minotaur, Pegasus, Falcon 9. I did divide Falcon 9 into the five original flights and the three version 1.1 flights. As a matter of fact, the version 1.1 is up there in the 20%. The one in the 25% is Antares, I just mentioned it. But it's fine because this curve now shows the Bayesian probability. So it takes into consideration that launch vehicles with a small number of flights are penalized by the short number of uh, trials that statistics have to prove the statistics. But the important thing is the shape of the curve. And I come to two statistics, to, to two conclusions out of the shape of this curve. Number one, that in order to have a vehicle whose honest probability of success on the next launch is close to the historical average of 5% or better, you need something like 20 launches. 
The uh, second is that even at a very large number of launch attempts, something like 3%, 4% is close to the asymptote of what you will ever get. So now that we've taken a look at reliability and where we are and what we can expect in the future, let me take a crack at the issue of cost. Now, this is a very emotional issue. If I had here Mike Gass on this side of the room and Elon Musk on that side of the room, we'd see some nice sparks flying as to what constitutes expensive or not expensive, costly or not costly. So I tried a little mental experiment. I've taken three what I call uh, milestone vehicles, three large Western workhorse Vehicle, uh, vehicles, the two EELVs and the Ariane 5, and I've tried the following mental experiment. Follow me with a little bit of patience, if you will. To begin with, I tried to estimate in 2013 dollars, very important, what customers have paid for the last 10 years of operation of these two launch vehicles. Since we are providers of commercial geocoms, we have pretty good insight on the commercial market for ge geotransfer orbit launches and what a good estimate is of the average $2,013 prices that Ariane 5 customers have paid. So the number I came up with is about $11.3 billion. Again, I emphasized in 2013 dollars. If you were to talk to uh, Monsieur Israel, um, he would say, well, if I add up all the money they've given me, I don't come up with that number. That's because they were in then-year dollars. Figuring out the corresponding amount for the ELV is even tougher. What I did is I went to the uh, July 2012 Government Accountability um, Office study on ELVs. And they were answering a different question. They were answering, why is it that ELVs cost more than was what's originally planned? So their concern was uh, non mccurdy breaches and increases in cost and so on. However, in addressing that issue, they came up with the best estimate I've seen so far of the total program cost to the government of EELV, and they mentioned as part of that study, how much Boeing and Lockheed put on the development program at the very beginning. So that is the total expenditure that the ELV program had from its inception to actually later in history when they would have completed a certain number of flights. And they were kind enough to divide it into the Atlas V part and the Delta IV part. What they were not willing to provide was how the de whereas the, on the Atlas V, even though there are nine different configurations of Atlas Vs, you can pretty much average out the differences in cost. You cannot do the same thing for a Delta IV. So I had to make a bold assumption that Delta IVs come in a variety one and a variety three core. And I essentially divided the total cost by a number of cores, both built and projected to be built under this budget and derive a very artificial, I must admit, price per Delta IV core. And then I simply said a Delta IV heavy is three times a average single core Delta. Very crude assumption, but that's the best I could do in order to mm, arrive at those 13 billion and 11.7 billion dollar figures. I then took the actual number of flights in those 10 years, looked at the specific performance for each of the models of Ariane, Atlas, and Delta used. And I used the GTO capability because that is a common, relatively large market for this class of vehicles. And I come up with almost a three to one difference in the average dollars per kilogram between Ariane 5 and Delta 4. That's why I said that my gas would probably be waiting with, for me with a bat at the exit of the garage. Why is that? I totally refuse to believe that that's because of some mm, higher competence of the French, I mean, European engineers or European managers over the American managers. I totally refuse to believe it's some 
dastardly conspiracy to keep prices high by anybody in the government or at ULA. It has to have some intrinsic reason. What are the differences between these two launch vehicle systems? To begin with, the number of flights. Ariane, with its five different configurations, is still one vehicle serving one market. For historical reasons you're all familiar with, the US government chose to force Atlas and Delta to coexist as self-competing vehicles in a single market, therefore almost automatically chopping the rates by a factor of two for a given market. Ariane has a single launch location in French Guiana. EELV has to provide separate launch locations in, for, in the East Coast and the West Coast for each of the two launch vehicles. And finally, EELV has to operate under a cost reimbursable contracting form where their costs are scrutinized and their fees are based on a percentage of those costs. And they have very little incentive or ability to negotiate and perform cost-cutting uh, activities on their own. Ariane, on the other hand, competes in the external market. If their costs are high, people will go to Proton or, God forbid, to SpaceX. So <laughs> I call this by the way, you should realize you know, that yes, we are competing with SpaceX on the CRS space station resupply market, but the first two commercial geo spacecraft that SpaceX has launched successfully, SES-8 and Tycom-6, were built by Orbital. And I was there in the, uh, at the launch of SES-8. I was in the same room with Elon. So you know, we're, we're very good friends, so to speak. Certainly, learning curve is one of the components of this difference. Our experience in building, uh, we're up to our fifth Antares airframe being put together right now, and our seventh, uh, sixth Cygnus uh, service module being put together. Our experience is if the, that if you set aside fixed costs and look exclusively at the recurring operation of fabricating the same launch vehicle or the same satellite, the learning curve of your labor, the economies of procurement in, of supplies in batches, lead to a learning curve in the classical uh, use of the term of anywhere between 0.7 and 0.8. So 0.75 is probably a good assumption of what the learning curve is. If you look at the points labeled Delta IV, Atlas V, you see that those two happen to lie on the learning curve of 0.84. So if the only difference between those two launch vehicles was rate, it would show 0.84. So something else is at work. If you look at Ariane 5 and where it should be on the, say, 0.75 learning curve, you have that bar there with a the question mark for other things that have changed. What are those other things? And here's my uh, rather um, daring mental exercise. Now, at the risk of adding one more chapter to that immortal classic, How to Lie with Statistics, what I, I took a model that considered annual fixed costs, the uh, learning curve rate, a cost of a mythical airframe that you build only one per year, and assume that that was the same for all three vehicles, because after all, they're very similar in capability, size, and technology. And similar for the fixed cost. This is my own very personal and subjective estimate of what the fixed cost would be for any single launch vehicle this size per year. So I left as variables to be fitted the cost of the single airframe and a number I call the competitive factor, which essentially captures everything else. The fact that it's fixed price contracting, so Ariana's Pass and their suppliers can, can vary their cost without the customers looking over their shoulder and telling them, yes, you can do it, no, you cannot do it. Um, and putting all together and doing a curve fit, I come with a competitive factor uh, value of only 0.81. 
the cost per kilogram has a, a, a factor of three between delta four and Ariane five. Yet this competitive factor that I mentioned only has a value of 0.2. It is not insignificant, but it is not a factor of two or three. Uh, let me now go to ways in which we can reduce uh, the cost of space launch. And let me start with a big no. Um, when the shuttle was developed in the waning years of the period I call the Dark Ages, there was a lot of controversy as to whether the shuttle really was going to reduce costs, and if so, by how much versus expendables and so on. And there was this big controversy between foes and friends of the program as to what discount rates to apply and so on and so forth. But the amazing thing from our standpoint today is in the middle of all that controversy, what was constant was the assumption of the number of flights that darn system was going to have. If you look at this famous plot from the, um, um, uh, what was the name of that company? Um, uh, Mathematica Inc., thank you. Um, they're all looking at between 600 and 736 flights in the 13 years between 76 and 90. So a rate of between 46 and 56 per year. Nobody challenged that zone. It challenged discount rates, it challenged configurations. <coughs> Nobody um, challenged that. Now, if we go back to this figure, this, oops, wrong side of the laser. Uh, this is, I think I lost my pointer here. Okay, this is where they assumed the shell was going to be. This is where it ended up. So, we all know that the shuttle has run its course. It was a great technological achievement, but certainly from the standpoint of reducing launch costs, it didn't work. You're all familiar with this picture. It's been used a thousand times between the concept that people had, which was an aeronautically driven concept. People then, and sometimes people today, still believe in the comparison between rockets and launch vehicles and airplanes. I just show you one of our Antares equals 98 Boeing 747s in terms of energy. So why do we continue? Why every seven years somebody in a certain government organization whose name I shall not mention, but it com it's comprised of five letters, comes out with an yet another study of reusable launch vehicles? I just can't believe it. So mm, here's an interesting note. Um, in, 19, in 2000, Orbital was, was one of several companies that did a study of the second generation RLV effort for NASA. As a matter of fact, Doug Stanley, who's not in the audience, but you know, his predecessor at NAE is there, was a leader of that program. And uh, he pointed out to me that if we were to do a reusable launch vehicle in 2000, the sweet spot in number of flights that would justify reusability was also 50 to 60, just like in the mathematic analysis in 1972. And we were wondering why this was the case, and he reminded me that the basic performance of a launch vehicle is determined by two physical parameters, specific impulse and structural mass fraction. Specific impulse for engines that lift off from the surface of the Earth is determined by the amount of energy in either um, uh, ionic or covalent bonds that mm, essentially determine the en reaction energy of chemical reactions. And the space shuttle main engine developed in the mid-80s represents the 98% utilization of the available chemical bond energy in the best possible propellant pair that we know, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Structures, the key physical force is the intergranular force that keeps uh, polygranular, uh, polycrystalline materials, which are all of the things that we know about today, yet until we find out how to build a, a nanotube single molecule fuel tank. We are also the 98%. Compare that with Moore's law that says that every two years or so, the number of transistors doubles on consumer electronics, and we are 
years away from hitting the physical limits of quantum physics or principle of indetermination or so on and so forth. So that's the dirty secret of launch vehicles. On the one hand, they're very high tech. We're dealing with power densities second only to nuclear explosions. On the other hand, the fundamental technology on which we rely is at a dead end. So in my view, there is no hope for improvement in performance and reduction in cost coming purely from technology. So reusability is out, at least until somebody can prove that we can fly a single launch, a one type of launch vehicle 60 times a year. Technology is out, what's left? Rate. To what degree can we increase the rate? If we build them, they will come. And that's the last argument that I want to make, and then I'll, I'll let you go, which is, where's the money? In the apocryphal words of Gus um, um, Grissom in uh, The Right Stuff, no bucks, no buck rogers. The worldwide government budgets for civilian space is about 40, 40 billion dollars, of which 18 roughly is the US part. There are various estimates of what the um, military budgets are, but at, at best it's another third or maybe a half. So the worldwide, ex the US expenditures in space are in the 20 to 30 billion dollar range. If you look at the worldwide expenditures in space launch, commercial, military, civil government, whatever. It's about six and a half billion dollars, of which in the US, the US component of that in, in the year 2012, which is where this data comes from, was 2.2 billion. Out of a US government budget of probably around 30 billion dollars. So, imagine for a minute that Elon Musk succeeds and ULA goes down, Orbital goes down, uh, Musk is able to reduce the U.S. government cost of launch by a factor of two. So instead of 1.1 billion, the government only has to spend 1.1. Sorry, instead of 2.2 billion, only has to spend 1.1 billion. The government lives in a constrained budget environment. What have you done? You have increased the buying capacity in space of the U.S. government by what? Five percent. So. Um, if, um, sorry, uh, less than that, two and a half percent. So if having the cost increases your demand two and a half percent, microeconomists call that a price elasticity of 0 0.05. Let me go to the most beneficial example where reduction in launch costs reduces the cost of the space operation. We just saw it. The cargo carriage to the space station is mostly that. There are no direct TV costs. There's a satellite, the spacecraft, but it's the highest value content of launch of any space-based service that I know of. And there, I'd say that about 40% of certainly our cost is a launch vehicle. And again, the government is a constrained budget customer. If we reduced our launch cost by a factor of two, we would allow the government to buy another 20% of more cargo flights, which means an elasticity of 0.4. And I could go on for examples, but the bottom line is the, mark, the, the launch vehicle, launch services market is a price inelastic market. And that has consequences on the behavior of the providers. If you're a monopolist, you are incentivized to keep prices up because you can get all the market can bear. If you're not a monopolist but you're regulated, the amount of income you will generate is a fixed percentage of your costs. What is your incentive to reduce costs? It's only when you are in, an unregula or in a free market, a commercial market, that you're allowed firm fixed prices that you're incentivized to reduce costs. So, in a nutshell, what are my conclusions? Number one, the space launch physics and economics are very different from aircraft. Launch vehicle technology has reached its asymptote, its maturity. Don't expect relief from magic in specific impulse and mass fraction. 
It's an inelastic market. You're not going to generate twice the number of flights if you reduce the cost by a factor of two. But both cost and reliability are driven by launch rate. So what, what is my conclusion out of all of this? We have to reduce the size of the launches. You saw that plot that showed that we have fewer and fewer medium-class launch vehicles and more and more large launch vehicles. The consequence is our launch rate goes down. So our launch rate goes down, our reliability, again based on this rule of thumb that says we're going to have one failure a year, our failure rate goes up. If we believe in the 0.75 um, learning curve, the number of production units will go down. So the answer is in the customer base that they should move down from very large satellites, very expensive satellites, to more modest class satellites, and that will increase the launch rate. And finally, for those customers that are still in a cost plus, cost reimbursable negotiation oversight purchase of launch vehicles, stop, cease and desist. Take a page from SES and um, TICOM that took a commercial risk in placing their satellites on an unproven but lower cost, firm fixed price, commercially competitive launch vehicle. Doesn't matter who builds it. The fact is that Falcon 9 is a commercially priced, um, fixed price contract to the vehicle. So these are my consequences. I uh, thank you for your patience. I apologize for the delay. I uh, hope you have a rest of, nice rest of the conference. Thanks. Uh, questions, or we don't have yeah, time? You, you okay. All right. Sorry for the. Uh, Dr. Elias has, uh, has graciously offered to take a couple questions, but before we do that, let me do my duties. Uh, on the part of the AIAA Honors and Awards Committee and make a presentation of the Medal and Certificate for the Von Karman Lectureship. We have to be close yeah, to... Let's get over here a little closer. No kisses, okay? I guess that... Uh, let's, play, no. let's play this the other way. Okay, all right. He's a, you can tell he's a professional. Right? <laughs> he does this for a living. Thank you. All right, now I would like to say a, a couple things before we take the questions. First of all, our sincere apologies to you, Antonio, for the, the snafu with, uh, with the hotel audio. Uh, what a shame, but we appreciate uh, your willingness to press forward and... Uh, and let us get that fixed for you. Secondly, you implied when you came up here that I had made a Freudian slip. No one on the front row seemed to notice it, but if indeed I suggested that on Sunday of this week you grappled a dragon at ISS as opposed to a Cygnus, you know, I sincerely apologize to you, to David Thompson and Frank Gulbertson. No, that was not a Freudian slip, Dave. You said Antares went to the space station. Oh. And that is actually what a lot of people think. A lot of the tourists that went to Wallops on Thursday that I talked with was convinced that that big thing was going to go to the space station. And it's amazing <laughs> how people in, in, in the community and in the country do not know what a satellite or what a spacecraft is. Well, it's a rocket that goes to space, right? Everybody knows that. <laughs> All right. Do we have anybody in the audience who might like to ask a question of Dr. Elias? You're kidding me. Yes, sir. Well, the, the question was, Antonio observed that we've reached almost the asymptote of chemical energy at 98%. Did you pick the question up, sir? Because I missed the question well, itself. I, I, I think your question was whether I thought that there was actually alternatives that we could have. People have been looking at alternatives since the 50s. They've looked at high-energy boron-based uh, 
uh, propulsion systems, very nasty stuff. And it's been just too long and too many people, smart people, certainly smarter than me, that have looked at the problem that if there was any chance of having chemical propulsion of higher performance than spatial main engines, we would have found it. Any more? Yes, ma'am. Elaine? <laughs> Trouble. Yeah, uh, this is a question of Bayesian analysis, and you know, if if it if I have a certain probability that the fourth is a, is a success, what happens when I reach the fifth one? Am I nervous? Well, it's funny. I, I'm in the unique position of being both a provider of certain launch vehicles and a customer of certain launch vehicles. So it depends on which day you talk to me. If you talk to me as a provider day, I'd say, hey, Lane, no sweat, no problemo. By the way, I didn't invent Bayesian analysis. Aerospace Corporation uses it. And as I said, Ed Kyle in, in his uh, website has a very nice analysis. And he does a much better job than I did at figuring out this difference between families. And of course, he uses his own version of what constitutes a success or a failure. Now, Bayesian analysis is in a way more conservative than simply dividing the number of successes by the number of trials. But it's in, it's in a way a little bit too conservative because it, it essentially says that uh, statistics are blind, which is a favorite thought of statisticians. And I'm not sure I'm convinced of that. I think there is a certain purely random element to success, but there's also a method. If you haven't changed what you've done in the past and you've done the same thing in the recent past, then your probability should be a little bit better than what straight Bayesian analysis produces. Okay, anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, let me try and paraphrase your question because I'm not sure I fully understood it. Uh, I think you're challenging the simplistic model that says we have one launch failure a year. What happens if all of a sudden we go from the numbers that we have today to a very large number? Does the rate go to zero? No, so you said that the um, number of launch failures is asymptotic, Yeah. So yeah, those, those two models are not consistent, definitely. Um, both models are approximate. Right now, at the range of launch rates that we operate in, they are relatively consistent because we are at the 4%, 5% rate. Um, my point is, to paraphrase uh, Norm Augustine, we have to be careful that we don't have a budget and an increase in cost and size of launch vehicles, so the number of launches goes down to 10 a year, because then we'll have a 10% launch rate. If we have 60 launches a year, that would be a nice problem to have. Yeah, one, one more, if anyone has one. All right, well, Antonio, I want to thank you one more time for uh, for sharing the value of your experience. Oh, we've got one. I apologize. Opinion on Orion SLS. I'm gonna go out on a limb here. I think both the SLS Orion approach as well as the commercial crew approach both have merits and both have excellent chances of succeeding. Unfortunately, there is no independent market for human spaceflight. It is a government market. Also, unfortunately, I believe the US government only has enough budget to support one of these two approaches. And there has been a political decision to support both. 
which means the budget required to support each of these approaches will be insufficient. Therefore, we have doomed both approaches to failure. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to end this conversation on that positive note. <laughs> but again, Antonio, let me thank you very much for sharing the uh, your experience in our industry and our insights into the issues of space transportation. If you would, one more time, let's give Dr. Elias a round of applause. <laughs>